So good morning, everyone. I ask you to get a seat. My name is Rudi Marlow. I am the representative of the Claims Conference in Germany, and I have the honor and the pleasure to lead today's morning panel. I would like to start by thanking Mr. Stauber, thanking Sarah and Adi for the excellent organization of the conference, and as many in the auditorium, yes. As we have heard from many people in the auditorium, also I have taken out many insights from the last two days. I'm really looking forward to learn more today. Yesterday we talked about the implementation of the Luxembourg Agreement and which consequences it had for the Israeli society and further what the compensation did for the individual claimants interestingly going into even changing their identity in a certain part. Today we will focus on the struggle for compensation and restitution of Jewish property. And when we talk about the struggle of compensation, we obviously are talking about the perspective of the victim's side on the so-called Wiedergutmachung. If we take a naive look at the theoretical overall picture, we would think to see matching intentions. On the one hand, there's the willingness to pay for damages, and on the other side, there's the willingness to file for compensation and restitution. However, from a victim's side's perspective, the filing of compensation and restitution claims has heavily been perceived as a struggle, as many survivors had to fall back on the help of lawyers, for example. And this indicates a disconnect, a gap. And I hope that by lunchtime we will have answers to this question. In this matter, it might be also interesting to analyze whether the word Wiedergutmachung in itself has been made survivors more reluctant or hesitant to file for a claim for compensation. In any case, as we have also heard yesterday by Judge Porat, the word Wiedergutmachung has a repulsant meaning for Holocaust survivors and Jewish organization, and the claims conference does not use this word. This also does not change if the etymology of the word Wiedergutmachung is explained, or if the user of the word attaches a different meaning to it. History has changed borders of countries. History has changed relationship of countries. And yes, history has changed also the, I would say, the connotation of words. And what has been used in the past has been used in the past, and that cannot be changed, but what we can change is obviously the future and the present. And so it is not without any reason that modern societies change words if they deem or feel that they are disrespectful or not inclusive enough for certain minorities. And the examples are obviously and many faults. Our first lecturer, Today is Dr. Kim Wünschmann. She has taken a modern approach in her work to the Institute for History of German Jews in Hamburg. By using the medium of graphic novels, as Art Spiegelmann did very successfully in his comic mouse. A prominent German TV network, the NDR, Norddeutscher Rundfunk, once wrote about her, Dr. Wünschmann and her team are looking for new ways to make polyphonic Judaism audible and visible, whether in comics or digitally. The culture of remembrance must become younger. Ms. Wünschmann obtained her PhD from the University of London and subsequently held position at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the Center of German Jewish Studies at University of Sussex, 
and the LMU in Munich. Her research centers on Holocaust studies, European Jewish history, legal history, and comic studies. And her publication includes Before Auschwitz, Jewish Prisoners in the Pre-War Concentration Camps, published by Harvard University in 2015, and awarded the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research, and co-written with Stephanie Fischer, the Force Coming Oberbrechen, a German village confronts its Nazi past. Your lecture titles today, The Luxembourg Agreement as a Comic, A Graphic History of Restitution and Compensation, and I'm very curious and know um, to start it, can you start your lecture and to learn about those aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this conference for the wonderful organization. It's a great pleasure, it's an honor to be here and contributing to this important gathering. What I will present to you today is a graphic history of restitution and compensation and this graphic history is a collaborative project funded by the Volkswagen Foundation conducted by Dr. Stephanie Fischer from the Center for Research on Antisemitism at Technical University Berlin and myself. Together with the Cape Town-based artist Liz Clark, we work on a visual history um, of the Holocaust and its aftermath, harnessing the potential of comics, the potential of visual storytelling for historical <coughs> research and for education. We study Jewish-non-Jewish -Jewish relations in the village of Oberbrechen during the 20th century. And here you can see a map from the comic that gives you a bit of geographical orientation where Oberbrechen is located. And you could also see how we work with historical photographs and incorporate them into our comic. We ask, how did Jews and Christians live together in this small town in Hesse in West Central Germany before 1933? And how did Nazism impact on the social fabric of the place and how did it change after 1933? Who took part in anti-Jewish persecution? Who profited from expulsion, dispossession and murder? The project does not stop in 1945. We explore post-Shoah relations between the Christian villagers who remained and the former Jewish neighbors who survived the Shoah in exile. What was at stake for those on either side as they re-established contact after 1945? What does this case study tell us about attempts to restore justice through reparations? Before I will take you deeper into the comic um, and discuss how microhistory matters when analyzing the processes, the complex processes of restitution and compensation, I would like to make some brief methodological remarks and address questions that some of you might have asked yourself and have in fact asked me since they saw the title of my presentation. And these questions may be similar to the ones posed in a very forceful manner to artist Art Spiegelman, whose two-part long comic, Mouse, many here in the audience will know. Why comics? Why mice? Why the Holocaust? Spiegelman's choice of medium comics has caused controversy um, since the work was first published in the 1980s, and it causes controversies until today. Many of you will remember that earlier this year, a school board in the McMinn County in the US state of Tennessee has voted to remove the comic from its eighth grade curriculum because of depictions of violence, nudity, and foul language. It's a comic about the Holocaust. The debate about Mouse raises fundamental questions of representation, and in particular, artistic and visual representations of the Holocaust. How do we deal with aesthetic representations, aesthetic expressions of painful histories? What is an adequate and what is a dignified way to speak about the Holocaust and the ongoing trauma that outlives the actual violent events in the post-war era? 
Think about the debates about filmic representation of the Holocaust, shuttling perhaps most vividly between the polar opposites of Spielberg's Schindler's List, which portrays so much, arguably too much, violent history, and Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, which strictly abstains from staging any historic images and remains in the present and in the abstract. Charles Friedlander, Hayden White, and others have explored these burning questions of representation already at a 1990 conference in a later volume aptly entitled Probing the Limits of Representation. In the wake of the linguistic turn, historians and other scholars reflect critically about their work and the various modes of historical emplotment. Some, like Richard Evans, have come out in defense of history try to reconcile the discipline as a science, as an art, as a craft, with the postmodernist challenges. And the bottom line of this debate is that historians should know that they construct narrative and that their narratives can and perhaps should always be debated and disputed. So, why comics? Literary scholar and comics researcher Hilary Schutt studied Spiegelman's work extensively. Here you can see the cover of her monograph, Disaster Drawn. She also worked with Spiegelman on Meta Mouse, that is the making of, of Mouse. And she compellingly answers this question, why comics, uh, when she says, and I quote, Mouse developed a unique idiom of representation. She places comics in a longer drawing to tell tradition, according to which experiences of war and violence found powerful expression in images, even if those images are very difficult to look at. Shoot quotes Jacques Chalot's 17th century etching Les Grandes Misères de la Guerre and Francisco de Goya's etchings Disasters de la Guerra from the early 19th century as early examples of graphic testimony and this drawing to tell tradition. Nazi atrocities, as you know, were depicted in many images produced in the camps and ghettos, often in secret. As acts of self-assertion, these graphic testimonies were a way of coping with overwhelming experiences. As acts of resistance, they document crimes and they secure evidence. Uh, just think of the four photographs from Auschwitz-Birkenau clandestinely produced by the Sonderkommando prisoners and, by the way, also visually quoted by Spiegelman in Maus. I want to very, very briefly discuss some fee key features um, of, of comics and make you familiar with comic research, uh, which is then helpful to understand how Stephanie Fischer and I construct our graphic history, and in particular, the chapters about Holocaust restitution and compensation. In comics, at first glance, the constructed nature of historical narrative is obvious. Hilary Schult states, and I quote, comics are evidently staged, built, made images of history. The hermeneutic act is ingrained in the very form of representation. Here we have a form that is constantly aware of its own mediation, linking documentation and testimony with artistic practices such as visual abstraction and drawn metaphor. At the same time, this is an intensely personal form of representing history. Secondly, we see whole pages at once. The reader can decide where to look first. They control the pace of reading, the direction of reading and viewing. And comics does transgress conventional understandings of chronology, linearity, causality. And this is why they are such a suiting medium for memory and testimony of violent pasts. There would be much more to say and to analyze, but I'll keep it short that we can go to the graphic history as we chose of our medium to study Holocaust restitution and compensation in new ways, trying to find new approaches to a history so full of, as we've heard in the past days, contradiction, imposition, irritation, re-traumatization, issues of dignity and humanity, power politics, existential questions for the individual survivor, for the Jewish collective, and for the young state of Israel. 
So how can we draw and represent restitution and compensation? This post-genocidal history that is so heavily based in written sources, legal texts, official documents, memoirs, and at its core, the hundreds of thousands of personal files containing the negotiations of the survivor claimant with the German authorities. Quoting the few photographs of high political milestones which are stored in our collective visual memory is a starting point. And just as the organizers of this conference and also the producers of the film Reckonings, we used the famous photograph of the long table in that room in the Luxembourg town hall on which Foreign Minister Charette, JCC President Nachum Goldmann, Chancellor Adenauer surrounded by their respective delegations signed the Luxembourg Agreement in September 1952. The drawing aims to represent an atmosphere that is very tensed. Not a word was spoken, silence surrounding the act of signing. And as you can see, the original black and white of the photograph has been colored, but the coloring remains very pale, perhaps in a sort of vintage style. Gray, black, brown, white are the dominant colors in these images. Even the flowers in the middle of the table look pale. Macro history is presented here in the most condensed and the most concise form, the image and the two text boxes. At the same time, it remains somewhat uh, closed and perhaps even unapproachable. Is this a historic achievement? Is this a successful example of transitional justice? The serious-looking men in their dark suits do not appear to be celebratory. And what does, high political, does this high political event even mean for the so-called ordinary people? Like other scholars have done before us, we contextualize the state-level decision, the diplomatic and the political history with individual lives. And here, uh, let me take you to uh, the case studies. One Jewish family from the village of Oberbrechen, the Liechtensteins, fled to Argentina in 1937. They settled in the Avigdor colony, established by the Jewish Colonization Association, the ICA, with about 100 families, mostly from Germany. You can see here, and perhaps my cursor works, uh, that we place Siegfried and Flora Liechtenstein, um, our protagonists, into uh, a heated discussion um, about how to react to compensation legislation. One thread of the panel, the panel number one, is uh, therefore the discussion about the practicalities of restitution and compensation. What is it actually all about? How does it work? What can be done? We know from research that information and experiences were shared in the network of survivors. Recommendations for lawyers were given to friends and acquaintances. And this is what we try to depict in panel number one. The next panel, panel number two, expresses the controversies. The woman says, I'm not taking any blood money from the Germans, never. The man says, they call this Wiedergutmachung, making good again, as if. Our protagonists, Siegfried and Flora, remain silent in this panel. The sources do not allow us to place them on the spectrum of discussion, and I think we discussed yesterday about really the difficulty to extract from the files the motivation of the claimants, and this is what guided us here in the construction of this panel. We, we simply do not know what, they, what their motivation was. As Flora and Siegfried walk away from the group, they think, they say, they do things that we do know from the sources. And without having read the text, you can see that this bottom part of the page breaks away visually from the uniform grid. Most clearly visible is the way that the panel frames dissolve and the color scheme changes into a black and white scene. And here we link the past to the present and flash back to 1942 when Flora Lichtenstein's sister Irma Hess, who had fled to Belgium, uh, was deported via Mechelen to auschwitz birkenau where she was murdered. A text box in the lower right-hand corner explains this. 
the absent, the lost, the pain, the murdered, are thus visually present, uh, and they were present, as we know, in the de deliberations of the survivors on whether and how to claim compensation. And these claims could be a reason to reconnect to former Christian neighbors. We see Flora Lichtenstein in the lower left-hand corner writing a letter that has been preserved in her compensation file. She's writing to a former neighbor asking um, for help and support in, in filing compensation. This correspondence is remarkable as it shows how survivors could trust, could rely on former neighbors and how they communicated about the Shoah at this very early stage. And here the contact with the old town uh, was a positive one. The next page is our attempt to graphically depict what we all know is the most ambiguous dealing with German authorities in the process of restitution and compensation. We see Siegfried Lichtenstein, former cattle dealer from the village of Oberreichen, in his battle with the authorities in West Germany, and we see him in the West German embassy in Buenos Aires. And we learn about the claim of his daughter, Irene, who, whose education was interrupted by Nazi persecution. So you can see on first glance, and this is what I meant with seeing comics all at once um, and deciding where to start reading, you can see that this page is heavily filled with written text, mirroring the text-laden source base. We decided to reproduce some of the documents, some of the sources here um, on the page, such as the correspondence um, of the, the compensation office in Wiesbaden with the mayor of Oberbrechen. And this correspondence shows the other side of involvement of former neighbors and Christian villagers. Asked whether he could confirm the survivors' claims, the mayor reports back, and I quote, none of the local residents can provide the requested information. In my estimate, the income of S. Lichtenstein cannot have been very high given the circumstances in which he lived. End quote. The Germans at the local level were downplaying the damage of the former Jewish neighbors, forming a coalition of silence, building up resistance against um, confronting a violent past in which the villagers themselves were, of course, deeply implicated. What is more, with their behavior, um, they increased the pressure which put the persecuted in the most uncomfortable and impossible situation. We see here how Siegfried Lichtenstein was questioned at the West German Embassy in, in Buenos Aires, and he defended his claims and made clear that the mayor was only a schoolboy when the family had to leave Germany. What could he really know? Another village authority was influential in the daughters, Irene Lichtenstein's claims, um, and this was the head teacher of the village school. He could testify on the anti-Semitic treatment that Irene had to suffer in school. And the last three panels depict her story. As the authorities doubted Irene's account, the head teacher's statement was vital for the compensation claim, but the fact that he had to be contacted several times, he didn't uh, respond for a long time, um, also shows uh, his hesitation, if not uh, resistance on his part. And we end the page, you can see, by again intersecting micro and macro history. Irene Lenkiewicz's claim for compensation was approved only days before Mossad agents captured Eichmann in Buenos Aires. And here we link to another form of reckoning and post-genocidal justice. The re-traumatizing effects of filing for compensation are perhaps nowhere as drastic as in the medical reports, and this was also already mentioned during the conference, that those medical reports that the survivors had to submit to the German authorities. We treat this theme at the example of another former villager, Selma Altmann, Selma Altmann filed for compensation for damages to her health and then had to go an examination at a psychiatric hospital in Los Angeles where she lived at the time with her husband and her sister. 
it is actually, and quite remarkably, only through this source, only through this medical report that we know of the violent history in the village. There are no other sources that document showing, showing you how vital it is to have this account, however uh, difficult. Harassment um, and abuse, which we depict in the chapters on the Nazi period, uh, brought back here in the form of flashbacks to again show that the past experiences of violence lived on and could lead to re-traumatization. We also show the German physician who reviewed his US American colleague's report and found, and this is in the thought bubble um, of, of this panel, um, I quote, in Mrs. A's case, no illness can be found that stands in causal connection to her persecution, end quote. My last example concerns uh, restitution, and here we can learn about the Christian villagers who had acquired possessions of their former Jewish neighbors. In the U.S. American zone of occupation, as you know, legislation was passed as early as 1947 to restore property forcefully taken from Jews. We see here a couple who had bought the house of the Stern family in Oberbrechen receiving uh, the official letter from the authorities to report the property. In order to keep the house, they decide to plea with the surviving members of the Stern family. First and foremost, their youngest son, Hermann, who had fled, uh, who had left uh, the village um, already before World War I uh, and immigrated to the US for economic uh, reasons. The case is interesting in several respects. First, as we can see here, this Christian couple seeks help from the Catholic priest of the village. Another important authority in the village community, apart from the mayor and the head teacher, the Catholic priest uh, agrees to support them. He uh, writes on the letter that is then sent to the authorities and also sent to the Stern family, and this is in the, in the compensation files, in the restitution files uh, as well. So Stern, who had lost two brothers in the Holocaust, decides that property restitution is less important to him than securing the memory of his family members who are buried in the local Jewish cemetery. Remarkably, but this would be a whole uh, another story, as the sources tell us, he strikes, indeed strikes a deal with those Christian owners uh, of the house on his own terms, um, does not claim back the family home, but asks them to take care of the graves at the Jewish cemetery. To conclude, the three case studies of restitution and compensation, the Liechtensteins in Argentina, Selma Altman and Hermann Stern in the US, have shown a variety of individual experiences and agency in dealing with restitution and compensation claims. They visualize attempts at post-war reckonings, and they demonstrate that restitution and compensation was not just a bureaucratic process when narrowing the scale of observation to the micro level. Reparations emerge as an intimate social history in which members of the local communities had to position themselves. The comic genre gives room for discussion of emotions expressed with the help of a broad set of visual techniques, drawing flashbacks to a violent past shows that there can be no closure with history. On the contrary, these traumatic experiences live on and they can trigger anew when confronting German authorities and former uh, neighbors. This, we would claim, is one of our strongest contributions to historiography to show and to visualize what we think of as the aftermath is in itself a history of violence. Thus, again, and here I come back to the features of comics, questioning um, conventional narratives of causality, chronology, and linearity. As a new form of abuse, compensation and um, a restitution was experienced by the survivors and uh, 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 was experienced as traumatic by the survivors and for a long time, perhaps until today, ignored by those on the non-Jewish side. 
As we have seen when discussing Holocaust comics such as Mouse, the specific visual grammar of comics allows for this unique form of representation of this very troubled and complicated past. At the same time, we can hope to use comics to make it accessible to broader audience and to carry this history into the future. Thank you very much.